Sister Simone Campbell, a proud member of the Sisters of Social Service, has served as Executive Director of Network, a national social justice lobby, since 2004. She is an attorney with extensive experience in public policy and advocacy for systemic change. In Washington, she lobbies on issues of peace building, immigration reform, health care, and economic justice. During the 2010 congressional debate about health care reform, Sister Simone wrote the famous Nuns Letter supporting the reform bill and got 59 leaders of Catholic sisters, including the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, to sign on. This action was cited by many as critically important in passing the Affordable Care Act. She was thanked by President Obama and invited to the ceremony, celebrating its signing into law. <laughs> And that law is proving more endurable than many thought. <laughs> in 2012, Sister Simone was also instrumental in organizing the Nuns on the Bus Tour of nine states to oppose the Ryan budget approved by the House of Representatives. This budget would have decimated programs meant to help people in need. Nuns on the bus received an avalanche of attention across the nation from religious communities, elected officials, and the media. Uh, over breakfast, she mentioned she's hoping to start a new tradition that would be N-O-N-E-S on the bus. <laughs> Sister Simone has often been featured in the national and international media, including appearances on 60 Minutes, The Colbert Report, and The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. <laughs> she has received numerous awards, including a Franklin D. Roosevelt Four Freedoms Award and the Defender of Democracy Award from the International Parliamentarians for Global Action. She has been the keynote or featured speaker at numerous large gatherings, including the 2012 Democratic National Convention. As some of you uh, were able to take advantage of yesterday at the book signing, she is the author of A Nun on the Bus, How All of Us Can Create Hope, Change, and Community, published by, in April 2014 by HarperCollins. When Sister Simone spoke at Creighton uh, a year and a half or so ago in our annual social justice lecture series begun in 1994, she received the only standing ovation in that long and impressive tradition of scholars and activists. Sister Simone's topic is 21st century poverty and the challenge of healing our nation. Please welcome Sister Simone Campbell to the podium and to this conference. I don't want to say anything, but the pressure is on. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's on me or on you. <laughs> oh, it's great to be here. Um, I I'm really excited to do this engagement following Brian's talk yesterday. I missed Ibu Patel in the morning, but I've been talking to a few of you about, about what was said. But I was really, I was able to hear Brian's and the nexus of the structure of racism and the issues of poverty go hand in hand and are often, uh, many make them synonymous. They're not synonymous, but they are mutually reinforcing. So I'm gonna mention a few of that and try to weave in some of what he was saying. Um, the, challenge is for us in this nation is we, among our challenges, you might have noticed we have one or two these days, right? <laughs> but among our challenges are, is the fact that our leaders keep speaking of poverty as if it were 1960. And the message is this, if you work hard, play by the rules, 
you'll get ahead. You just need a job. That, in the 21st century, is a lie. And we need to be very clear about reality. So to be very clear about reality, and since we're in an academic setting, and I'm totally intimidated, intimidated by academia, because I'm a practitioner, I'm not an academician, and I, I think what we need are some graphs, or at least one graph, okay? <laughs> And, uh, but to do that, I would um, like to invite some help. And what we're going to do is create a bar graph that demonstrates the change in income for the different quintiles, the different 20% of the population over the last uh, 34 years. And what I'm going to what we're going to do is to see the impact. Because this 1960s story of what poverty was grew up in a time when everyone's income was going up about 100%. The bottom 20% went between 1949 and 1979. The bottom 20% went up 116%. And the top 20% went up, I believe it was 84%. But we all know 116% of a small number is still a small number. And 84% of a big number is a bigger number. But everybody participated. And in that time, it grew up this idea, if you worked hard, played by the rules, you got a hit. OK, remember that time? Some of us remember that time. Some of us grew up with parents who remembered that time. But that motto has continued as the American dream. What we have now is an economic nightmare. But we still have the rhetoric of the American dream. And so what we have in Washington, DC, are folks like Speaker Ryan saying, well, we just need to incentivize work. People should get SNAP. The Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, if they're working, you should eat only if you're working. But if you're working, shouldn't you have enough money to buy your own food? Hmm, what's wrong with this picture? Um, so the challenge is seeing what's wrong with this picture. So last night I invited, I need five people to help me. So I was seating the dinner tables, hoping that some people would quickly volunteer. Come, come, please, please, I need help. And while they're coming up, let me just say, this is my commercial advertisement while we get set up, is out on the table outside are two magazines from our organization network. And they're both about Mend the Gap, but on different issues. So we have um, the issue on healthcare, and the issue on tax policy. And you're about to see why tax policy matters. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. You showed up. Good. Oh, yes, you remembered. I was afraid after all that conversation we might forget. So let's come down to this end over here. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a bar graph. And this blue line here with the rug, it's perfect, is going to be the x-axis, OK? And then right here, this way, is going to be the y-axis. And um, what we're going to do is, Jackie, would you please be the here we go, top 20%, the top quintile for the academicians. But I'll just call it 20%. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, Richard, I just blanked. Uh, Richard, you'll be next to the top, OK? Andrea, you're going to be the middle class. Now, everyone believes they are the middle class. <laughs> everyone. I, I had a lawyer who told me he made over $200,000 a year tell me he was the middle class. And I was like, doesn't the middle class wish that were true? <laughs> OK, Jenna, you're going to be the next to the bottom. And Dave, you're going to be my beloved bottom. OK, cool. Um, so let me just give you a little teeny bit of data just so you can think about this. The average income for Dave is, 
the average is $16,000 a year, the average. The, uh, Jenna's is 40,000 a year. Andrea is almost 67,000. Uh, Richard is 103,000. And Jackie is 213,000. And now all of you are calculating where am I in the mix of that. <laughs> I know that, figure it out, you'll be okay. All right. <laughs> so, uh, Jackie, you're going to be our uh, leader. So turn this, turn do, 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 this way, because you're going to go the y axis there. Okay, get your toes lined up on the rug. Excuse me, top 20%, you're trying to take an advantage. Back up. <laughs> you know, they always do it. Okay, now you can come forward, just against the blue. N not against the blue, not over the blue. All right. Okay, now remember I told you between 1949 and 1979, everybody's income went up 20%. Remember that? Okay. So, Jackie, I am pleased to tell you, oh, top 20%, that your income since uh, 19, uh, 1980 to 2014, your income went up 61%. And I am pleased to tell you that, that you're gonna take one step for every 5% change, and I did the math, so it's 12 steps. Now, as the first person to do this, what I advise is kind of strides. Don't take it, you know, ginormous, and don't do little mincy, don't do mincy bullshit <laughs> steps. Okay, line up. Perfect, okay, 12 steps. Oh, give me a break, <laughs> don't even do it. All right, real steps. No, 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 okay, I'm gonna walk with you, this is impossible. <laughs> she is just entirely too delicate, De delicate crate and flowers here. Okay, now line up, okay, there we go, ready to go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. <sighs> I believe that was exhibit A for how hard it is to wrangle the top 20%. Okay. <laughs> okay, Richard. Come on. Um, back. No, no, come, come here. You were, you were in the right place, but you were over the blue line. Okay, there you go. All right, Richard, I am pleased to tell you, between 1980 and 2014, your income went up 28%. You get five and a half steps. You ready? Go. One, two, three, four, five and a half. A half. I was a quarter, all right. <laughs> okay, Andrea, you, I am pleased to tell, beloved middle class, between 1980 and 2014, your income went up 15%. You get three steps. Ready? One, two, three. Love it. Jenna, beloved next to the bottom. <laughs> Okay, in the same 34-year period, I'm pleased and moderately horrified to tell you <laughs> that your income went up 6%. You get one step. Ooh. Okay, now Dave, line yourself up. Okay, now you might be worried you're gonna run into Jenna, but as they say, no te preocupes, está bien. Um, <laughs> During this same period, I hate to tell you this, but your income went down 9%. You get to take two steps back. One, two. Now look at this. We have Jackie over here at 12 steps is basically 60% with 61% increase, which is more than twice Dave in the next category, I mean Richard in the next category. More than double. And then we get the middle class, Andrea, who's only gone up 15% in 34 years. And you wonder why people feel like they're struggling. Hmm? 
And then Jenna's story of 6% in 34 years? To say nothing of Dave's as losing ground. The story of poverty is Dave losing ground. Now, Jackie uh, up there is hiding, not intentionally, but hiding some data. Because, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're hiding your sign too. Um, because uh, that is the average, the pulled together 20%. So I need two more volunteers. Can I have two more folks come join me, please? Obviously, it's not a difficult part. Would you just be willing to come? Okay, oh, yeah, here they come, here they come. That, go, go, come, come, come. Okay. Come on up. All right, come over here to our x-axis. So, in your name, Jeff, you're going to be the top 5%, and Sarah, you're going to be the top 1%, okay? Because these are the numbers that are hidden in Jackie's average. Okay, so old bar graph, take a step back, okay? You, Jeff, you stay here. Line yourself up. Oh, Sarah, you got great shoes for the part. That's fabulous. Okay, okay, you can bring your, your feet up just a teens to the edge there. Okay. Um, okay, Jeff, I'm pleased to tell you um, that the average for the top 5%, the average salary is 448000 a year. And I'm pleased to tell you that over the last 34 years, your income went up 106%. You get 21 steps. Oh, you're, you're a mathematician, genius, fabulous. Okay, 21 steps. Let's do it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Wait, wait, 16, 15. Make 15 inside the door because come back in and I want you to go up here. I don't want you outside. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Whoops, there you go. Okay, Sarah. Oh, beloved top. Come, line yourself up in your glitzy shoes. Everybody see your shoes? It's perfect. <laughs> okay. I am pleased, I am pleased and horrified to tell you that your average salary for the top 1%, and this, remember, this includes the 0.01%, the 0.00001%, and our beloved president, wherever he is, and the uh, average salary for the top 1% was $1.2 million. And in the last 34 years, your income went up 170%. So you get 34 steps. You ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. Okay. What do you think? We have trouble in River City with a capital T. The challenge is that among the challenges is that Sarah, way out there in the top 1%, she is really far away from the lived experience of 80% of our people. And the Sarahs of the world are the ones that are more apt to sit on Jesuit college and university boards. <laughs> and the challenge is all of us, all of us take our lives as normative. Say, see the wallpaper of our lives and assume it's everybody else's wallpaper. And so it's hard for the Sarahs to understand the joy of flying Southwest Airlines. 
or taking public transit, or knowing what it is to have kids in a public school. And so you get this foolishness about school vouchers and school choice as being, but it as being the way forward because it comes out of the choice of the rich. That's their world. But what they don't know is that Dave here is working two jobs to try to get by without benefits. Because the vast majority of low wage workers have no health insurance, have no retirement benefits, have no support systems for their family, affordable childcare, or anything like that. Then, the American Psychological Association did a study a few years ago of who's the most stressed. You know, they're always interested in stress. And so, <laughs> what happened was, they discovered that it isn't Dave's group that's the most stressed. Dave's group knows their toast. And the only way they can get by is in collaborating, is working together, making community, helping each other out. And so one of the guys that, or one of the women that we met in uh, Jefferson City, Missouri, Angie, she talks about how she, low wage worker, keeps an eye on and tries to keep her, the rest of the neighborhood and tries to keep her car going so they can provide support for people needing to get around because their public transit only works from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. And the low-income community has no way of getting around. And so her neighbor, who's a mechanic, helps her keep her car going. But they know they have to cooperate. What the American Psychological Association found out was that Jenna's group is the most stressed. Because remember, her income only went up 6% in 34 years. She has seen family members slip back, like Dave. She knows the stress and the struggle and the anxiety of just trying to survive. But Jenna also represents one of the Trump supporters that I met on the bus last, well, I guess, no, it was in the fall, not, it wasn't on the actual bus. And he was so angry and really for Trump. He was for Trump, it was his man. So I said to him, well, how come? Talk to me about it, well, what do you like about him? He's tough. I saw him on television, you know, he said he's, you're fired. He won't take anything. And then I said, well, well, what do you have to be so tough about? What, what are you worried about? He said, well, oh, my, I'm worried about my kids. I mean, they graduated from school. They, they, I don't know if they had AA or BA degrees, but they'd gotten their degrees, and all they have is debt, and they haven't been able to get a good job. And, you know, my parents always told me if you worked hard, played by the rules, you'd get ahead. But I haven't gotten ahead either. And then he went on to talk about what his parents, had, what he had expected and he had not accomplished. And he just kept talking about his parents. And I said, for reasons I don't know, I think it's the Holy Spirit, but said, the, <laughs> said to him, it sounds like you feel ashamed that you haven't measured up to your parents' expectations. Is that true? And bam, he got tears in his eyes. And what I realized is much of the anger is masking the shame that they have not measured up to what they were told. Worse than that is the stories, as we'll find out next, of how this happened. They supported policies that did it to them. This is a worry. Okay, so Jenna's the most stressed. Sorry about that. You, you understood. Okay, feel your pain. I got it. But the second most stressed group is not Andrea at the, as the middle class. Rather, it's Jeff, the top 5%. Because Jeff wants to be Sarah. <laughs> Jeff is highly 
um, oh, we would call it leveraged, in debt. Remember, this is income. The stress often is around debt and living on the edge of a bubble to look like Sarah, to want to be Sarah, to hope to be Sarah, and the stress of the indebtedness is really a challenge. So those of us that do, uh, it took me a while to figure this out, but those of us that do uh, you know, go around inviting people to join us in mission, as we say, in other words, give us money, um, <laughs> the, the thing that I've, I've discovered is that the top 5% who I thought had big income and could be very generous, in fact, are highly indebted and cannot be in order to make their families survive. So it's living beyond, living in expectation of moving up. See how that works? Now, we did um, a, let me see, oh, oh, so, the, excuse me, before I launch into that, the two other things that happened is that if you work for minimum wage, minimum wage gets you just over $15,000 a year if you're working one job. And remember, Dave's average is 16,000, so that means you've got at least a gig and a half. In um, uh, a few years ago, in the Obama administration, I was at the White House and I met this beautiful woman, Robin, a young woman, like late 20s, I think, and she said she worked full time for minimum wage. She was proud that we were there for a signing of an executive order and she wasn't going to get a raise, but her good friend was going to get a raise because of this executive order. She was all excited. And she says to me, you know, I know if my friend gets a raise, eventually I will too. And then we talk some more and she says, you know, by look, oh, she worked in a profitable clothing store chain full time and had worked there for over a year, still making minimum wage. And this is in Northern, she lived in Northern Virginia. And then she said to me, you know, by looking at me, you would never know I have to live in a homeless shelter because I can't afford rent around here. So in the city where we are, Seattle, there are t there's a tent city that moves around to church parking lots every three months. The churches donate their parking lot and the, the Citizens of the tent city regulate themselves. Most of them go out to work, but cannot afford housing. In San Jose, I just heard about, some of you are from Santa Clara, I, I met a couple of you. Um, the San Jose, one of the parishes there, opens up their church parking lots so that families can park their cars overnight in the church parking lot for families living in their cars so they can have a safe place, use the restroom, have some activity for the kids in the gym. That is what's happening here. 65% of the folks living at the poverty level have at least one adult working full time in their household. 65% of the households. An additional 12% are retired, an additional 10% are disabled, that leaves us a very small percentage of people, of households without anyone employed. The issue is wages. Oh, so we did these business roundtables because I was upset. We need real living wages for our people. And so I was in Chicago and had a bunch of Sarahs in the room. I loved it, it was great. They were all guys, Sarah you would have diversified the group, though, though I, I agree with Brian, talking about diversity is not the best thing. But anyway, so I got, it had just come out that the average salary for a CEO of a public, publicly traded company was $10 million a year. And they were going for 12 million, or 11 million. They just wanted one more. And so I said to him, guys, what is it? Are you not getting by on 10 million? You just need another mill? Is that the problem? And they go, oh no, Sister Simone, it's not about the money. <laughs> what? You could have fooled me. And they say, no, 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 no. It just happens 
that we're very competitive. We want to win. I get that. I want to win. I'm a good lawyer because of it. But, but we want to win. And it just happens that the measure of winning is money. So I said, well, couldn't you pick something a little less toxic, like how many Twitter followers you have or something <laughs> like that? But this idea of winning is what drives this. But how is it supported? Let me tell you the five policies that created this problem, OK? There are five policies that created this mess. And the first is, remember President Reagan? Some of us are old enough to remember President Reagan, California export. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm a Californian. I felt really bad. But <laughs> President Reagan changed the narrative about the founding of our nation. He changed it from the sense of the community to one man on a horse riding into the West, the rugged individual taking care of settling the West, all by himself, himself. But the fact is we are not based in individualism. It is an unpatriotic lie that got marketed by a presidential candidate for the purpose of creating tax cuts for those at the top. Because he then went to trickle-down economics, where he said, remember that? Some of us remember this, trickle-down? Oh, yeah, if we give Sarah and her friends a big tax cut, they'll make jobs. And making jobs is what Richard and Andrea and Jenna and Dave need. Now, I'd like to say that was 34 years ago. Well, it was more than that, but the numbers we're using are 34 years ago. And it is wrong. It never worked. And so Pope Francis, oh, good Jesuit schools, you can cite the Pope. Pope Francis says, enjoy the gospel. See, the truth of the situation is that some people continue to defend trickle-down theories which assume that economic growth encouraged by a free market will inevitably succeed in bringing about a greater justice and inclusiveness in the world. This opinion, which has never been confirmed by the facts, exhibit A right here, um, by the facts, expresses a crude and naive trust in the goodness of those wielding economic power and the sacralized workings of the prevailing economy. Meanwhile, the excluded are still waiting. It's tax policy that cut the tax rate for those at the top from basically 90% down to 33% that began to incentivize big salaries. That is the challenge. And as they incentivize big salaries, they lost sight of the need for salaries here. Second thing that happened was the undermining of unions. Because when unions were undermined, principally, somewhat Richard, but mostly Andrea, Jenna, and Dave, lost any clout or bargaining power. And I know some of your universities have been engaged with unions, and it's been a struggle for you all. Because the dominant rhetoric is, oh, unions are bad, got to keep costs down, can't afford it, it's a problem. Justice demands that we come to the table. And workers can only come to the table if there's some equal power and sharing. That is why our founding social justice document in the Catholic Church, Rerum Navarum, is all about organizing, the right to organize but it comes close to home. <laughs> the other day at Network, my little organization, I said, well, maybe we should form a union. And staff said to me, well, if we did that, Simone, you couldn't be a part of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, what a thought. I'm management, who knew? <laughs> but the challenge is that without a voice, 
the problems of Dave down here trying to support his family and work in, you know, food service. The other thing that our corporations, our corporations, I'm sorry, our universities do is to... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do it on purpose, but all of a sudden it dawned on me, bam. Um, the, um, is to outsource to get a cheaper rate. And the principal reason you can outsource and get a cheaper rate is because they pay less salaries, fewer benefits, more irregular work times. What is justice in a Jesuit institution in that time? The other piece that I heard is money the measure of winning is some people in academia have told me that some of the increase in uh, cost of higher ed is because if it costs more, it's obviously better. Money is the measure of winning, so we're obviously good. We've got the, we're close to Harvard and what it costs, isn't that great? What does it do to your students? What does it do to your ethos? What does it do to your approach to what matters? Okay, let me see if I've got all my points. And then we'll talk about what in God's green earth do we do about this? Individualism. <gasps> I think we did. Okay, let's thank the human bar graph and thank you very much. Sarah turned hers in. She didn't want the long walk. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so what do we do? How am I doing? This reality of income disparity is tearing our nation apart. And a uh, a book called um, Spirit Level by Wilkerson and Pickett, published, I believe, in 2009, was how we at Network got onto this. Because what they did was use the UN measures, they're British researchers, to use the UN measures to say, to ask the question, in developed nations with greater income and wealth disparity, what's the quality of life? And what they found is, where there's greater income and wealth disparity, there's a lower quality of life. And of the 16 developed nations, or no, 18 developed nations that they studied, the United States was 18th for income and wealth disparity and for quality. The shocking fact is we all do worse. What happens? Sarah and, Je and Jeff become anxious and nervous. And there's higher incidence of drug and alcohol use. There's high, lower economic, excuse me, lower educational achievement at all levels. There's a higher incidence of obesity. Infant mortality rate is higher at all levels. And they think it's some, possibly because, somewhat because of the stress of individualism, because of the stress of having to do this alone. But they didn't do, go in too much to the causes, but it's, very, there, it's ex, uh, very clear in the data is we all do worse. So having read that book, I said at Network, our organization that advocates on Capitol Hill, I said, well, we've got a... <laughs> We, ha we have to study this, we have to understand this. So we spent a year in a campaign that we called Mind the Gap. Mind the Gap, which we thought was pretty funny, studying income and wealth disparity in our nation, and you had to have been rich enough to travel to England to get the joke. <laughs> but, um, so Mind the Gap was just studying about it. But then, after about a year of doing that, in 2011, we started our campaign to mend the gap. We need to mend the gap in our nation. And we're about to have a tremendous fight on taxes. 
which is the single most important um, element that generated this income and wealth disparity in our nation historically. And Speaker Ryan's approach is to double down on trickle down economics. And if we double down on a failed policy, it's gonna get worse for Dave. It's gonna get worse for Jenna, Andrea, Richard. To heal our nation, we need to wade into these waters of complexity around things like tax policy. To heal the, our nation, we also need to wade into the waters of advocacy around healthcare. It's easy for Sarah's crowd to say, oh, you know, pay your fair share, pay your way, you don't need help. But they don't know the stories. I was on, uh, I did, um, I was in Tucson, Arizona before the healthcare vote and to gather data to try to influence McCain and Flake and um, there talking to Maria, she had never had healthcare. She was a mom, raised her kids, did menial work, uh, I mean house cleaning and uh, childcare and never had health insurance. Finally, Medicaid gets expanded in Arizona. She gets health care and gets a checkup and goes to the doctor. And it was a new experience. And they discovered she has early stage of ovarian cancer. But they caught it. She has treatment. She has had a recurrence. She's terrified that her treatment now is going to be interrupted if they take it away. That is what we're talking about. So... Tax policy connects and healthcare connects to the stories of our people. And that's where I think our work in education is, is the being able to have our hearts broken open by the stories of real people, by Robin's story. Let me tell you about another person in Dave's category, Thomasina, who I met uh, last fall when we were doing our educational campaign. And I got her talking about, I get, well, she was in a GED class of 25 people. And we got, I got them talking about what they were worried about in the election. And Thomasina blurts out after I showed the video side-by-sides that we'd made comparing Trump and Clinton's uh, policy stances on wages and on housing. Thomasina blurts out, now I can vote. I wasn't going to vote because I was afraid I would hurt our country. And I was puzzled. I said, what? All she had seen were the television ads that were all negative, And she had no idea how to choose. Seeing just a little bit of data of actual comparisons freed her up to be able to choose. And then I was talking to her afterwards, and she's a proud mom of two girls. She works full time, does GED class, and was almost going to get her GED. She said her proudest moment was just before school started, that she had sold her old clunker car for $150 to buy her two girls new school clothes so they wouldn't be made fun of when they went to school. It was an experience she had never had, but she was so proud as a mom to give that to her kids. See, it's those qualities of stories that matter, of hardworking people, that change the lie. And so what we have to do, I believe, in our work in seeking justice, is to work with a reverence. The picture that Brian used yesterday of Magis, you remember how that was, where that internal blue, I loved it, it was gorgeous. But my sense was that it is in that contemplative, reflective, intuitive space that we make the connection. 
that we see that Maria from Arizona and Thomasina from Indianapolis and Robin from Virginia, they're all connected. And we then let our hearts be broken by their stories because their stories are not our lives. But when we hear their stories, we know we have to change the wallpaper of our lives so that we act in a different way. So that we can advocate and claim a spot for them that is in dignity and reverence. So I urge on you, urge, radical acceptance even of the folks that we want to vote off our island. Because radical acceptance is really what the gospel's about. Is radically accepting the truth of whoever it is that you meet. And then, we're all justice engagers here, instead of thinking of fighting against, because if you fight against, push back against, you know how we say that all the time? Or oh, we're going to push back against what's happening in Virginia. We're going to push back against this, that, and the other thing. I say it too. But what I've realized is if I push back, I reinforce the thing I'm pushing back against. Healing happens when we not fight against, rather we fight for a vision when we fight for an alternative, when we fight for the people we've met who've broken our hearts. I, gave, I talked at Emory University to a board of trustees types, and this one guy got really upset at me because I kept talking about my people, my people, and, you know, Robin and Maria and all these people. And... Uh, he said, well, you're dividing us. You're dividing us. And I didn't feel it in my heart. So I said, well, how am I dividing you? Finally, it dawned on me. This wealthy serotype wanted to be one of my people and thought he was left out of my care. So what that taught me is when you go to your board of trustees for education, you bring a heart for them, too, to invite them into seeing a vision and knowing stories that are not their own. Because if they have an experience of Dave and Jenna and Andrea and all these folks, that changes the heart, lessens the judgment, and builds the community. That's the challenge that we're facing in our nation right now because it's all about individualism. So if we engage in tax policy, health care, immigration reform, it's got to be rooted in the stories of real people. Hopefully all the way along the economic line because that's what breaks the heart. And again, Pope Francis, Pope Francis says if you want to build peace, you've got to do four things. You gotta, I thought the easiest one was hungering for unity. So I thought I'd start off hungering for unity and then I discovered the difficult corollary of that mean, meant I had to give up my desire to win if you hunger for unity. So I'm not so sure about that one, but you gotta hunger for unity. <laughs> you have to be willing to dialogue. You have to tell the stories. Realities are more important than theories. And oh, academicians. You can fight about a theory forever <laughs> till the cows come home and nothing moves. But tell stories to illustrate your theory. Ground it in the lived reality of our people. And then the last thing is the whole is greater than the parts and if you don't have the whole at the table, we're not gonna make peace, Pope Francis says. So to do this, I urge on you, I too have four things to urge on you. So as missionaries of this justice endeavor, I urge on you four virtues for the 21st century. You're ready? The first one is I beg of you exercise the virtue of joy. Too often, those of us that care about this stuff, we get rather grim, have you ever noticed? We get pretty grim, kind of down. 
upset. Watch too much NBC or listen to PBS and oh my God, it's terrible. And then we say to our friends, come join us. Please, a bit of joy. Because the root of the gospel, what I've discovered is in having my heart broken open by all these people, it releases joy. Because you know what? Joy is a communal virtue. And when your heart's been broken open, you're not alone. And so together we can be joyful. Let it out. When you get into that grim space, it's usually because I think I'm in control and I feel super responsible. I think R is my middle, init middle initial for responsible. But no, that good. joy. Let joy be the hallmark. The second is exercise holy curiosity. Holy curiosity is where you ask people about their stories or what do they think. Holy curiosity came to me when I was at um, the University of Chestnut Hill, and I was talking to a freshman there, and she was all preppy. She looked really great. She had her pleated skirt. She looked like a freshman that she was, all new and minted, special. And then she asked me, well, could she talk to me afterwards? And I said, oh, of course, of course. And we go off and talk. Holy curiosity, I discovered that for the four weeks before school, the dorms opened, she was homeless. And she had told nobody on campus because she, she felt ashamed. And then to discover, she tells me this story about her mom had been arrested and she was still in pretrial detention. And, and she, Brittany, was the first person in her school family to go to school and she was a little nervous but really excited and it had been really hard and she'd only had to sleep out a couple of nights when she was homeless and she tells me this all stoic and then she says to me and I just got back my first English assignment and I only got a B plus and with that she burst into tears I was in tears hearing her story I grabbed her held her and what I realized was there is so much more that first-generation college students don't know and don't have support systems for, that if we don't ask the story, getting there is half of it, but staying there is a huge challenge. So how do we create a web of relationships strong enough to support them? Holy curiosity helps. The, sec the third virtue for the 21st century is sacred gossip. Sacred gossip, not ordinary gossip that goes on in faculties, no. But <laughs> sacred gossip where you tell the stories that have broken your heart, where it becomes the norm to let it be broken open and shared. And finally, the virtue of doing your part. Control and this um, is a part of this white supremacy thing that we think we individually are in charge. And the downside of the Reagan theory of individualism is we think it's all up to me. I volunteer to God regularly. Step aside, I could fix this one. <laughs> and it's not true. The challenge is, is that we're called to be communal and in relationship. The challenge is I'm only responsible for my part. And a couple of you have told me, you've heard my Krista Tippett interview, so you'll know this next line, but my meditation on what was my part led me to realize that, you know how, how Paul says, you know, not everybody can be an ear, not everybody can be an eye, that we're one body, but you have different parts to play. So I said, well, what is my part? And so I came to understand my role, my current role in the body of Christ is I'm stomach acid in the body of Christ. <laughs> Toxic in large quantities. <laughs> Need to be contained in a small bus. But what I do is I go around 
the country liberating energy, stirring you up. I cannot do the work you do. I depend on you to connect and do the direct service and be a part of this. Do your part. My part is to liberate energy in this moment and do politics on Capitol Hill. I can't do your part, but I know it's great comfort to me to know that you're doing your part, because then we are indeed one body. Being one body is what we're called to. And I believe that's what Jesuit education is really about, is to know our place together. So it can feel a bit overwhelming. It can feel like a bit much. It can feel like, oh my glory, it's so nice here with people who understand me. And then I'm going to have to go back and fight the administration and the department and the budget and the blah, blah. <laughs> But so I want to leave you, I want to leave you with a poem that I wrote when I was feeling like that. And it's called Loaves and Fish. And the thing you have to know about it is that, remember it's the story, it's in each of the Gospels, actually. It's the only story that's in every Gospel. And it's the story of loaves and fish, and they're out in the countryside, and the people have been following Jesus for more than 24 hours, you know, not 24 hours, but you know, like 12 hours. And the apostles are getting nervous, and they say to Jesus, send them back to town to get food, they're gonna get grumpy. And Jesus says to these poor doofus apostles, he says, <laughs> Well, feed them yourselves. Well, isn't that what he says to us? Feed them yourselves. And poor Peter is like, oh, well, we have a couple of day-old loaves of bread and a couple of stinky fish, but what's this among so many? And so the story goes, Jesus has everybody sit down in groups of 50, ever the community organizer, and he <laughs> blesses it, breaks it, hands it out. And in Matthew's gospel, it says 5,000 men were fed to say nothing of the women and children. <laughs> well, as you've already heard, I have an odd prayer life. So my prayer life, because that made me mad, was what was this about? What are we, chopped liver, for God's sakes? <laughs> but here's what I figured out. This came to me in my prayer, is that Matthew only counted the ones who thought it was a miracle. The women <laughs> knew they brought snacks from home. I know in my family, guys would come in, you know, all the uncles, they come in, wow, look at what a feast, what a miracle. <laughs> okay, so, with that, this is a poem, Loaves and Fish. I always knew that the miracle of Loaves and Fish was sharing the women have always known this. But in this moment of need and notoriety, I ache, tremble, almost weep at folks so hungry, malnourished, faced with spiritual famine of epic proportions. My heart aches with their need. Apostle-like, I whine, what are we among so many? The consistent 2,000-year-old ever-new response is this. Blessed and broken, you are enough. I savor the blessed, cower at the broken, and pray to be enough. Thank you very much.